800 years ago, the people of Kenfig built what they thought was the perfect town right here on the coast. It was a thriving commercial success. And then it vanished. Today, we think the town lies buried somewhere under these immense sand dunes. Over the next three days, we want to find out how big it was, what it looked like. So this has to be the smart end of time. We've got a superb wall. And how the people here fought to survive. Show! So will we end up with a medieval Pompeii or will we just be digging a load of sand? Might find a sand castle. Kenfig Nature Reserve in South Wales. Vast, peaceful and untouched. The perfect hiding place for an incredible secret. Time Team's been invited onto these grassy sand dunes to hunt for a medieval town swallowed up by a natural disaster. If you go 20 metres to your left from the point you're at, I think that looks pretty good from up here with regard to the terrain. 500 years ago, a series of violent storms buried the entire coastal settlement of Kenfig under an unimaginable amount of sand. Leaving only the crumbling remains of a castle and a big ditch. Yeah, that's about it. This is the edge of the grid, there. Time Team site director Francis Pryor thinks there could be an archaeological treasure trove waiting to be found here. And he's eager to get stuck in. And we can follow a level. Yeah. Francis! You started already then? Yes, I have, Tony. Thing is, we've got a heck of a lot to do. There is so much archaeology here, but it's all under the, under the sand. Look, you see it very much better when you get right up to the top and look down. Okay. I see what you mean. Great view of Port Talbot Steelworks. <laughs> yeah. What can you see here that would indicate to you there was once a medieval town here? Well, you see that ditch down there, that very wide ditch where we got the, the trench with the digger and fills down there? Yeah. Right, that ditch goes down there, under our feet here, goes over there for about 50 metres, then goes through an angle and goes round the other side of the site. Then. Um, as far as we know, that's all going to be town, and there may well be town on the outside of that ditch. That's massive, isn't it? We've got a huge job to do. What we've got to do is we've got, got to locate some key points. Right, a church, high street, marketplace. These are the sort of pegs that we could hang our clothes on and reconstruct the town. I said earlier that this could be a medieval Pompeii. Was that just hyperbole? No, there was a natural disaster. OK, it wasn't a volcano, it was wind-blown sand. But the thing that makes Pompeii so fascinating applies here, and that is there was a natural disaster. People said, oh, my God, they left their houses out through the back door and everything that they were doing when they were last living in those houses is fossilised, is frozen in time. I mean, to be quite honest, it has the potential to be incredibly exciting. Our first target is Francis's big ditch. Could it be the castle moat or the town wall? Behind it might lie all the features you'd expect to find in a medieval town. Streets, shops and houses. Kenfig's buildings may no longer be visible, but the local community still owns the land where they're supposed to be. There's even a local archaeological society dedicated to unearthing its secrets. Hiya, folks. 
a nice, fantastic yeah. landscape. I mean, it really is. It's and its members are sharing their knowledge with Time Team's newest recruits, Alex Langlands and Mary Ann Ochotta. I can see why you're drawn to it. How long has the society been involved here? Coming up next year, it'll be 20 years since yeah. we started down here. Yeah. And in that time, we've uh, actually found something like 6,000 pieces of pottery. Wow. We've actually found a number of coins, uh, Roman buckle. I mean, for me, it's really difficult to try and even conceive of what this place looked like because it's changed beyond recognition. But in your own lifetime, has the site changed? Yes, it certainly has. In the last 30, 40 years, it used to be just sand, which was very mobile uh, and unstable and was blown about. Now, because of the growth of, uh, of grasses and plants and trees, indeed, uh, it's become much more stable. And it is very difficult to visualise uh, what it was like in medieval times when perhaps there was no sand at all. Shifting this sand is going to be one of the hardest things we've ever done on Time Team. Do you think that's the other side of the bank then, Matt? No, that's it's just more of this. See this windblown sand yeah. on the other side, that's it. That's an army, yeah. And it's playing havoc with our geophysics equipment, so using it to detect underground structures is likely to be a bit of a problem. Another great site you brought us to. <laughs> well, yes, John. I mean, it is a great site. Look, we've got 10 metres of sand in some places. Yeah. We've got all these earthworks. Resistance isn't going to work because yeah. of all the sand. My hope is that the magnetics may work, because if you really have got a major settlement be below these dunes, yeah. we'll see you know, the, the buildings, hopefully, but, you know, it's, it's not easy. We'd be up a creek without a paddle if the geophys doesn't work. If somehow we can't see through the sand, we can't remove it physically. There's no machine big enough in the world. You know, we really do depend on you. Go on, you can do it, John. <laughs> so no pressure? No, John, none. So until we know whether the geophysics is going to work, We'll have to do it the old-fashioned way. Well, Whatever we've got, gonna... it's going to be in, underneath all this yet. nice yellow sand, isn't it? Wait a second. Is that stone or pot? That's stone. <laughs> Whoa, that was well like a bit of pot. <laughs> I'm going to wash that up. That is a piece of stone, Marilyn. Why are we using it in an old Check this out, look. So is our crack team up to the challenge, or will it crack us? We're going to turn to an unlikely source of help, the people of medieval Kenfig. Luckily for us, they've left behind a wealth of written information about the town and their lives there. What evidence do we have for the actual establishment of Kenfig? Well, we have evidence which suggests that what we're looking at here is the establishment of an Anglo-Norman town. In other words, a town that's been introduced in the Norman expansion into South Wales about 1140. And the records themselves are, are giving us a fascinating picture of a, a sort of a society on the edge, if you like, I think, uh, because we're very much on the frontier here. And we've got this, this fascinating interaction between the Anglo-Norman invaders, the introduced populations they bring into towns like Kenvig, but also the Welsh and the Highlands, and a good example here we have uh, extracts from the pipe rolls. Ah, oh, pipe rolls are like charter records of it, accounts and stuff. Indeed. And, and, and what this specifically is showing us is the delivery of timber mm -hmm. to effect repairs. And the reason they're needing to shore up and repair things is because we're getting a series of Welsh attacks. And uh, that's telling us something about this, this, this tense relationship. It'll be really interesting to see if any of this is picked up in the archaeology that we get on site. Yeah. Kenfig was something of a wild west town, built slap bang on the frontier dividing Norman England from medieval Wales. It was attacked and burnt again and again. Bit of charcoal, Tracy. I don't know whether it's enough to argue for the uh, burning of the castle. <laughs> Midday, and Phil's still trying to work out whether our ditch is the town wall or the castle moat. The problem is there's so much sand. 
can't even reach the bottom of it. We're really starting to struggle. But could our geophysics maestro have a surprise in store? John, excellent. Some geophys. Yeah, and it's worked. And the results are fantastic. What's particularly exciting is we appear to have two lines of what I can only see as buildings. And we talked about would we see the roads. Well, there's the gap. Yes. And follow the line uh -huh. straight into the castle. That, I think, has to be an east-west axis. That's yes. beautiful, isn't it? Uh, and so unexpected, Tanya. I mean, you know, it, it is absolutely what I want. Y yes, but it seems to me that you're confronted with a real problem, which is where to dig, because you could put a trench in virtually anywhere and you'd come up with archaeology. Oh, oh, yeah, it's quite easy, isn't it? What's that? Well, I, I think you'd go from one of the putative buildings yeah, to the to line the of the putative road. Yeah, we would. I mean, it would be so embarrassing if that turned out to be some geomagnetic anomaly or something, you know. It is a geomagnetic anomaly. <laughs> it just happens to be called a house. house. <laughs> <laughs> so we're putting in our second trench to see if we have a geomagnetic anomaly. Sorry, an east-west road and a house. So there's potentially a house up there. Yeah, this should be right. OK. OK, and then the house should start about here. Right. OK. <laughs> Fingers crossed, then. And let's hope we don't have as much sand here as we do in Phil's trench. Yeah, Phil. Don't go too near the edge, Tony. Just keep well. Ah, it's funny that you should say that, cos I was just going to ask you, you spent your life excavating in southern chalkland. Yeah. What's it like compared with this stuff? Oh, it's a doddle chalk. Although ch sand is wonderful to play in, it's lethally dangerous to work in. You dig a hole in the sand and you simply cannot trust the sides of the trench to stay up. And you get no warning when it's going to go. It will trap you around the ankles and it will gradually then it can fill up. And li literally, it will compress your ribs and, and you literally, you are, can be a goner. So how do you cope with that danger? Uh, where well, you just have to cut your coat according to your cloth, really. I mean, we simply won't be able to dig as big a hole here as we would say in chalk. We'd literally have to take out a hole, I don't know, 10 metres across or something like that to get to the bottom of the ditch. But what you got here is lovely, isn't it? Absolutely superb, yeah. I mean, we got the, we got the bank and then where the lads are cleaning down, the actual filling of the ditch. So what we want to do is burrow into that and actually excavate that and, and actually reveal the profile of the ditch. And is this the bank around the castle or the bank around the town? Ah, now there's a question I can't answer yet. After a whole day's digging, it feels slightly frustrating that we've only just scratched the surface. Still, over in our second trench, we may have our medieval road. That looks to me, Raksha, oh. like you're on the money. Yeah? Yeah, we're definitely on to what looks like archaeology here. There's like charcoal flecks in there. Yeah, that is definitely archaeology. Yeah. We're also starting to get some really decent finds from both trenches. As well as our uh, food vessels, we also have drinking vessels. I have to say, this is my favourite. Not only because I found it, but I just love the way you fit your thumbs into the holes there for the decoration. I just, it's lovely, that bit. <laughs> These jars would have contained possibly something like a weak beer. Weak beer. <laughs> Don't do weak beer. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a long day. <laughs> and the mere mention of weak beer does funny things to an archaeologist. So while John teases Francis with yet more geomagnetic anomalies. I head off for a more sobering view of our site. whether our celebrations may be a little premature. Somewhere among all those lumps and bumps is medieval Kenfig. And it's almost as though from up here you can see some of the shape of the town, can't you? 
And you've got in that big trench the, the mound which may mark the ditch, which was the perimeter of the old town, and next to it the, the little trench where Rakshar found what she thinks could be one of the houses. But more than anything, what I can see is the sheer scale of the site. Have we bitten off more than we can chew? I honestly don't know. We just have to get stuck in again tomorrow. Beginning of day two here in South Wales and somewhere under all these dunes is the lost medieval town of Kenfig. Yesterday, John did some fantastic geophys after which we found a ditch and a mound which are very significant and also part of a medieval house, but then Yesterday evening, he did some more geophys, which he got even more excited about, and which he adamantly refused to let me have a look at. So, come on, John, show us this geophys. Look, we've expanded the survey now, and the results are just getting better. This possible range of buildings I talked about clearly is a line that continues under the dunes. But as we've gone towards the castle, it now looks as though this response here could be the north-south axis. So we're going to follow that yeah. and take the geophysics in this direction. Well, because both of these roads, that one and this one here, the new one, are curling in towards the castle. That's the key thing. So we're starting to get the complete picture um, of the town. The problem is, from what we know of Kenby from the documents, we know it's really quite an expansive settlement. OK, this is too small, really, to contain a borough of 150 town plots, which is what Kenby was at its peak. So I think we do need to start looking outside of, of these ring ditches. We're struggling to get the inside done if you're talking about going beyond. <laughs> I appreciate that, but I'm wondering if there are areas out there we can target mm. to get a handle on this much larger settlement. It's a bit of a conundrum. The documents tell us Kenfig was a large settlement, and if they're correct, it simply wouldn't fit inside the area enclosed by Phil's ditch. And yet we've definitely got signs of a town here. Good grief. That's a metal surface, isn't it? Oh, yeah, this is your road for you. That's absolutely solid. We're starting to reveal the east-west street, which is looking really well preserved. And that's not all. John's geophysics suggests we might have a second road running north-south. But how much of the town lies inside the ditch? And is there a lot more beyond it? Perhaps if we follow the two roads, we'll find out. I reckon, Cassie, the road surface is going to be a good metre below there. Well, they've got a metre in their trench. Yeah. Already, and we're a metre above them. Yeah. So I'm thinking two metres. <laughs> While it's too early to say how large the town was, in Phil's ditch, we're beginning to get a better idea of what it was like to live here. I've been going through the records and there's quite a few really vivid accounts of attacks on the town, and particularly this one from 1232, where it says that the townsfolk knew that the Welsh were coming, so they send their cattle away and they actually burn some of the buildings inside the walls themselves. Then the Welsh turn up and make an attack on the, the foss and the palisade of the town and burn the town outside. I'm wondering if any of that is coming up in the archaeology. Well, we do have evidence of burning in the, in the layers here, so we can say there were fires, but we can't necessarily say they were fires that resulted from attacks. What I would say is that it does look like we've probably got a palisade defence. We've stripped off the top of the bank. There was never a stone wall up there. So your story that there was perhaps a, a wooden palisade there is yeah. very plausible. What's the thinking behind burning your own buildings? Well, it's an act of desperation for a start. Um, and one of the motivations is you don't want the enemy to get hold of, of, of have somewhere to live or to eat your food. So you burn the houses down. There is also a tactical aspect as well, because if you actually burn selective buildings, you actually create open space. So if the enemy do get in, you withdraw into somewhere that is defensible, and as they come across open ground, you ping them off with, with bows and arrows, and you try and drive them out. So we're pretty confident that Phil's got the town's defences. A bank and ditch topped by a strong timber palisade. 
But it's still not possible to say whether these defences surrounded the whole of the town. It's perhaps more likely they're an extension of the castle, its outer bailey. What we can say for certain is that these defences didn't always work. One of the things that struck us when we learned how Kenvig was raised to the ground time and time again was what a lot of business there must have been around for the local builders. So we thought it would be really interesting to find out how quickly we could put up a medieval house. Then we thought, no, what would be really interesting would be to see how quickly we could get one to burn. In the Hollywood version of history, a fire arrow could light up a medieval town like a Christmas tree. And then you aim and shoot. Right, OK. But did it really happen like that? In terms of, like, the siege warfare that we know happened here at Kenfig, at what point in the siege would these arrows be used? The fire arrows would be the second wave, because they don't go very far, because they're, they're great heavy-headed things. And when they land in the buildings, then if there are dozens of them, then as they go off, so you've got to get to them all. Right. And if the buildings are quite high, you don't find the first one, might smoulder for hours. But if I'm the um, defender here, you know, I'm the Norman, I'm stood there on my keep, and I've noticed this Welshman here creeping up on the castle with his fire arrow. What, what sort of um, materials are they using to actually keep the, the arrows alive? Um, you would, on the arrow, you would use uh, something like um, uh, linen, charred cloth linen, yep. and then you would light that with some accelerant or another, or possibly without accelerant at all, right. um, because you're not delivering flame, to, yeah. uh, strictly speaking, you're delivering something which is on fire. What you've got to remember, though, Alex, yeah. is while I'm going in there and while I'm running back, yeah. all my mates are behind me, and they're all firing at you. Yeah. A whole country full of people shooting at you. So Poor I, Normans. We can handle it. We don't have the time to build an entire medieval house. We've got three days, not three months. But we do have a bale of straw and two archaeologists dressed like a couple of pantomime extras. Fair to eat my flames, Alex. Oh, it's good. Oh, oh it's very good. Oh. In theory, straw should catch fire more quickly than the thatched reed used to build medieval roofs. Oh, no, no, I had the line, just not the length. But Alex and Matt's early confidence soon appears misplaced. <laughs> oh. oh! Oh, no, it's gone out! It's smouldering. It's smouldering, quick, quick, let's see if it's going to light. That. Leave that for a couple of hours. Finally, the best our archers can do is to get the straw smouldering, <laughs> so they resort to cheating. Here we go. Going, going. Set fire to a village. <laughs> so at the end of the day, it's not quite how it looks in the movies. And perhaps it wasn't as easy to burn Kenfig as we think. Back on site, and the archaeologists are at full stretch. We've now got not one, but two trenches looking for the north-south road. We've got an edge. Right off in here. Very uneven. It's really quite exciting because under all this sand might also be medieval houses. And not to be outdone, Phil started to explore the area behind the defences. Rumour has it you've got a nice little find here. I've got a lovely little find. It's a very, very important find. What do you think of that? Ooh. It's a voided long cross penny. And what is a voided long cross? Well, a, a voided long cross sits very, very comfortably between short cross pennies, which literally have a very short cross, and a long cross penny where the cross goes from rim to rim. So you've got the top of the cross there like that, and then that's the cross bit there. Yeah? Absolutely. But you can see on this one that there are actually three lines that define the cross. Two silver and one black, yeah. Absolutely. Now, the three lines are distinctive of the short cross penny, but the long cross penny does not have that middle line. Normally it doesn't, but if it's got the black bit in it, is that the void? Absolutely. That is a voided ah. long cross penny. And the crucial thing is, 
that they are very, very tightly datable. And the date is, Mr Harding? 1247, Dr Harding, to you. Uh, that is, uh, Dr <laughs> Robinson <laughs> here, please. <laughs> but what is so exciting about that is it gives us a bit of story to tell, doesn't it? Which is that this place was burned to the ground in the 1230s, so by the late 1240s, it was doing well enough for people to be flashing around their voided long crosses. Yeah? Absolutely. So we've got these really good finds coming up and the trenches are getting bigger and bigger. We've got this sublime geophys from John. We're starting to move out from just excavating the town and now are going into the suburbs. What are we going to find there? Well, we'll begin to find out after the break. Time teams in South Wales hunting for the lost medieval town of Kenfig. And it's almost as if the natural disaster which buried this town 500 years ago has returned to haunt us. Yesterday when I was down here, the sun was shining and the whole place seemed like a holiday idyll. But this morning the wind picked up, the weather's changed completely, and it's not difficult to see how in medieval times the wind could have lifted a whole load of sand off this beach and dumped it on the town of Kenfig. Our problem, of course, is that we want to excavate as much of it as we can, and we've only got a day and a half left. We've now opened several trenches looking for the town's streets and houses. But the sand dunes which have built up over the centuries are really slowing us down. Cassie, this is some trench. Yeah, we need all this to get this, you see. Well, what you've got there is rather nice, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. It's really good and substantial. Really nicely made wall. It's well faced. It's a fairly large structure and you can tell that because in this layer down here, we're getting a lot of roofing slate out and we've got it's a nice piece of pennant sandstone with a hole through for the nail. And then what we've got that's really lovely are these, which are the ridge tiles. So they're, they're fired tiles, they're glazed with green, they're quite smart. You can just catch that bit of glaze there. And they'd have provided a really decorative finish on the top. So, and again, signs that we're looking at a, a well-made building. Looks a bit black and sludgy down there. That's timber. It's not burnt timber, it's black because it's waterlogged. And it's all sitting in with our roof slates and our, and our um, ridge tiles. So it looks like a roof has come off at some point and this is the timber that might well go with it. In which case, are we looking at a demolition layer, some kind of um, destruction? So we've got our second building. Lovely. we can now have our first go at sketching out a basic street plan. Our posh building lies on a north-south road which leads to the castle tower. There it links up with a second one running east-west. We've also got Kenfig's defences. But the area within these walls feels too small to have housed the entire town. Perhaps it's just an overdeveloped castle bailey. So the question is this. Is the whole of our town packed into this area, or do our two roads lead out beyond the walls into extensive suburbs? Jeffys have braved the worsening weather to find out. At last, John, we've got outside the Bailey walls. And what have you found? Well, to be honest, I'm not sure. The, the problem is we've got no responses in this area that equate with the ones we've got in that part of the Bailey where we've clearly got houses. Well, which is interesting, isn't it? Because, mm. Terry, you and the Kenfig Society have excavated outside the Bailey, and you got, as I recall, what, two medieval houses? Uh, but the interesting thing about it is that the building itself, and we don't, it wasn't a house, I'm sure it must have been a barn or an agricultural building, yeah. uh, uh, around it were what looked to us, and uh, I am pretty certain were, uh, medieval plow plowing uh, yeah. uh, remnants. Uh, so we, were, we felt we were definitely out of town, as it were, uh, just, just behind us there. Right. It, it, it certainly doesn't sound like a, an urban space, it does it? Certainly not. This is really confusing. Where we were expecting to find Kenfig suburbs, instead, we might have open farmland. What's going on? This can't be it, can it? All the documents describe a thriving, substantial town here by the late Middle Ages. Really, really uh, and, and we actually have a copy of the Charter of 1360 here. 
What does that mean for a town when well, it's got a charter? It's really important, really important in the sense that, quite apart from anything else, it, it, it confirms that it exists as a town. And that implies all sorts of other things, like the rights to hold fairs and markets. And something else that you could do, you could actually draw up ordinances. What is an ordinance? Well, it's, it's, it's sort of like a local law. So these are laws that govern the lives of the ordinary people? Yeah, everyday people, everyday lives. But this is a really good one. Let me read this one to you. It is ordained that no butchers shall cast no heads, feet, nor none other garbage in the high street, nor in no other place, to the annoyance of his neighbour. So there you are. You can't chuck your offal in the high street. You can almost smell the medieval town coming out of the documents. Yeah, indeed. You two don't know the half of it. Behind the town's defences, Phil is starting to find houses, and they're not exactly what you'd call, well, classy. I think that they've terraced into the side of the natural, and I think what we're looking at here is possibly the floor of a building. You yeah, don't yeah. know how far it goes that way. Now, the next thing that happens is that that building goes out of use, and the whole area at the back of the rampart gets used as a midden, a sort of municipal council dump, if you like. And then these stones here, are they part of that dump, or is that something different? <laughs> no, that's something different. What it is is a later building that's been built on top of the midden. This is one wall. You can see it's pretty scabby, really. Yeah. We've got one wall there, one wall at the back there, backed into the back of the rampart, and the fourth wall coming along here. I think it's probably a, a workshop or something like that. So some bloke's built his workshop on a pile of poo? Uh, well, exactly. But what I think it might mean is that the, the space within the bailey was getting really quite restricted, and so they were actually having to cram buildings in just to actually get them in. It's puzzling to think that a rubbish dump behind the Palisade could be considered prime real estate. If this is Kenvig's cheap side, it's certainly situated well away from what we think are the posher parts of town, our well-preserved east-west road and the area around the castle. We've got a superb wall. And that is completely unexpected, and it is a beautiful wall as well. Look well it it is. I mean, I look in that in that little sonda as you've done there. It's about what six, eight courses high. Yeah. And yeah. it's proper masonry. It's the first time we've had proper masonry on this site. Isn't it is. It? It's really nicely bonded, and you've got a really good face on this side. It, I couldn't have asked for a better wall. No. And the thing is that this wall, this, this I mean, I assume it's quite a grand house. And look, we're just back from the mm. from the castle entrance. This has to be the sort of the slightly upmarket end of town, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> OK. As our trenches slowly get bigger, it's clear the sand has done a fantastic job of preserving the archaeology. But there's still no sign of any suburbs beyond Kenfig's defences. And instead, we're beginning to discover quite a cramped town. So what did Kenfig look like? There's only one day left to find out. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to abide by the rules of Kenvik tonight, number one of which is, when I do that, you keep quiet. Why? Because it's the rule. <laughs> <laughs> but your little rosy face has been beaming most of the day, hasn't it? <laughs> well, it has been extraordinary, Tony, because slowly we've revealed the outlines of a completely unknown, buried medieval town. And that's never happened to me before in my life, and it has been fantastic. Oh, I mean, we carry on regardless about the weather. I mean, you know, I mean, if the archaeology is good, then we'll carry on. And the archaeology has been absolutely cracking, although I must confess. No, 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 no not yet. No, no, it's hey? the rules. We have the drinking after we've read the rules. <laughs> Marianne, give us the rest of the rules. Uh, uh, it is ordained by the said Port Treve. That's him. That's me. That yeah. all brewers oh. shall brew good and wholesome ale. Well, I should hope so too. No inhabitant of the said town shall keep no naughty packs, bawdry or suspected harlots, vagabonds, oh. Oh. nor loiterers. <laughs> Doesn't look good for you, Raksha. <laughs> <laughs> to vagrants, harlots, and naughty <laughs> Beginning of day three here at Kenfig in South Wales, 
where we've been looking at a medieval town which lay buried underneath the sand for centuries. Up until now, we've been concentrating on the area around the castle. You can see that sand there, that's our spoil heap. And we've uncovered a town that seems pretty wealthy, lots of big houses, broad streets. But now we're going to turn our attention to beyond the castle walls. Not here, that's not archaeology, that's just a big old sand dune. But over here, really, as far as that line of trees, there ought to be shops, houses, little plots, that kind of thing. The real question is, where on earth are we going to dig? The trouble is, geophys can't find anything here at all. And yet we've been led to believe from the historical sources that Kenfig was an extensive settlement, possibly with suburbs stretching beyond its defences. Francis, we're going to be here forever. Well, we do know that the main north-south road was coming through here, don't we, John? Yes, I mean, we've got that on the geophysics, but in the rest of the area we've surveyed, we've got no evidence for buildings at all. Yeah. I mean, compare the results from inside, and there's no, nothing like it out here. Hang yeah. on a minute, I don't understand. We have heard from the documents that there's a lot of plots out here, but there doesn't seem to be anything. Why are we bothering to dig out here? Why don't we just stay where we know the archaeology is? Well, if the town does stop, Right, then that is something that is completely unexpected and it actually makes that town, if anything, rather more important because it's so compact and the occupation is so dense. So Francis gets Matt to open a trench close to where the north-south road exits the defences. If we're going to find any suburbs outside them, this trench will be our best shot. So was the town much more cramped than we've been led to believe by the historical sources? It's beginning to look that way, and yet it was also fairly prosperous. Um, what we've got here is um, a buckle. Ooh, um, look at that. Isn't it lovely? It's really pretty. And what's really nice about this is that um, if we look at the actual frame itself, I'm just beginning to see just in this corner, it looks a little bit silvery. Now, that's either copper alloy that's been later tinned or silvered to make it look like it's silver, or it may well actually be silver. And I managed to date this quite securely to 1350 to 1400 um, from examples that were found in London excavations. It might be that this is a little bit later in date here by the time the fashion has travelled over to where we are now, over in Wales. Um, but it's nice to have that kind of date for it. So it seems the people here were doing well enough to afford the latest fashions and to build bigger and better buildings. What we got here is a really substantial wall. Puts me in mind of the castle wall, doesn't it, you? Oh, yes. The only difference is that wall's got mortar and this one's just clay. Right. But yeah. it's similar stonework and it's over a metre thick. This is a big, substantial, posh building. And the interesting thing is that these cattle prints in this dark cumic clay actually run underneath the wall. It's a very dark clay, it's yeah. very humic, it smells... Yeah. yeah. I think you've got a byre or a wooden cattle shed, some, something like that. And then you've got this big, imposing, posh building slapped on top. I think we're probably looking here at an administrative building, possibly, rather than a, than a house, don't you think? It must be. It's incredible to think that the site of the old cattle shed ultimately ended up as home to a posh administrative building. And it's got us thinking. As the town got richer, what happened to all the cow sheds? And are there any buildings here? Uh, there aren't any buildings. What we do have, though, is this lovely cobbled surface here, which is absolutely covered in charcoal. It looks like there was some industrial process going on here. I mean, I think there's far too much there for it to be a hearth or something like that. Mm. You've got a good, decent cobbled surface. It smells pretty terrible down here. There's a lot of burnt stuff, um, iron smelting, something like that. What do you think all that tells us? Well, I think it's absolutely what I wanted because we're just outside the settlement area and you tend to put light industry today, as in the Middle Ages, away from your housing. Yeah. So that confirms that this outer area here didn't have a lot of housing. The pieces of the puzzle are starting to fall into place. This little forge must have been typical of Kenfig's scattered suburbs. 
As the town got richer, these smelly industrial buildings would have been pushed outside the walls. But for some reason, the townsfolk were unwilling to build their houses here. What I want from you, Ray, is some idea of what might have been happening here based on other sites. I've actually brought a, a sort of a reconstruction drawing of Kidwelly. Now, Kidwelly's a bit west of here, yeah. but what you see here is an implantation with a fairly regular grid pattern, but actually in the extended bailey of a castle. And it's, it's, it's worth reminding ourselves, I think, you know, that this is, this is hostile territory from the Anglo-Norman perspective. You know, yeah. you, you, you have the Welsh still in the highlands who, who are coming down. So yeah. implantation in a bailey makes a lot of sense. But it's worth noticing, too, that we began to get suburban overspill. Yes. And here you also get much less predictable suburban expansion. So yes. that, that might be a good working model for us uh, mm. to apply here to Kenveg. So it's actually quite mobile then. This borough, instead of being a sort of fixed entity, actually it's, it's much more fluid and we should anticipate sort of settlement types popping up all over this area. I think that's probably a good way to look at it. Right. But perhaps we shouldn't be too surprised to learn that the people of Kenfig wanted to keep their homes within the defences. That is an amazing amount of burning. You do wonder whether or not this might have something to do with, with conflict or something like that. It's in the right place, isn't it? Given how many times they were attacked... My favourite trench on the whole site has got to be this one, with the little house nestling in the lee of the big mound that went round the castle, and then this thick midden material on top of it, and another house on top of that. But it's not just me who's been so excited about this trench. All day, local people have been turning up to have a look at Phil's work. Except, Phil, you've now turned your attention to this end of the trench. Look what we've got down there. Oh, yeah, this black stuff here, yeah. Absolutely, that is intense burning, and that burning is underneath the bank. Perhaps that burning is uh, an event in history, an attack on the castle, and as a result of that, they actually strengthened or actually built for the first time this massive bank. Well, we can't prove that, but it is a nice story, isn't it? So although Kenfig never dared to expand far beyond the castle's defensive palisade, its people were a resilient bunch. Each time their town was destroyed, they simply rebuilt it. They didn't just survive. Judging by what we found, they prospered. What started as a frontier outpost became as well maintained as the towns we know today. But it's this path in front of it. I can't remember a time team where we've had such an opportunity to see a really well-preserved medieval road. I know. It's astonishing, Tony. I mean, this is beautifully laid out. That's not just because we've cleaned it well archaeologically. No, I think it if, was like that. No, if there were deep holes and, and uh, potholes and that sort of thing, we'd have revealed them archaeologically. They must have kept it regularly maintained. Oh, well, I, well I, I know that, because in these uh, Kenfig ordinances, it says it's ordained that every Burgess tenant and resident dwelling within the town walls where the pavements or causeways have been mm. shall and do keep them clean from dung and other filth upon pain of 12 pence at every fault. Good grief. I mean, 12 pence, that's equivalent to 500 quid today. You know, I mean, that's a serious fine. Yeah, it's more than a bag of crisps, isn't it? Isn't it? And it completely dis it, 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 it demolishes our idea that medieval roads were rutted and full of mud and... But Stuff it, chucked from first-floor yeah, windows, absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. But look, out here is the road proper, and it really is, it's still good and hard. It really is hard. I wouldn't mind driving on that myself. The thing is, Tony, we never get to see medieval roads preserved like this, because normally you've got a, a late medieval road and then you've got a post-medieval road and then you've got layers and layers of tarmac and heaven knows what. And the medieval road isn't preserved under a, a mass of sand that, that's been blown in from outside. Yeah, it's a real one-off, this, isn't it? It's beautiful. It's absolutely fabulous, eh? The road, like the town itself, is a unique time capsule.
The sand ultimately forced Kenfig's inhabitants to abandon their homes, but it's allowed us to retell the town's history. Right, I think we're done, Francis. Tell them the story. Right, OK, folks, now this is a high-precision model. <laughs> That's the castle. This one here. <laughs> which is over there. Yep. And there are two sizes of yoghurt pots representing houses. Those are those. The, the, the big ones are the sort of high-status ones. That's where Cassie and Tracy were digging. Yeah. And then there's a, a main east-west road. Down there. Yeah. And to the left there, just behind the ramparts, is the rough end of town. <laughs> and that's where Phil was all <laughs> three days. No shame in that. No shame in that. <laughs> Better quality pubs, though. <laughs> <laughs> then we got another road heading out. This way. That's yep. it. Through the ramparts and then open fields and farms, and then for about 200 years, 300 years, that was the town of Kenfig, and then the winds got up and the sands gathered, and slowly the whole thing was buried. Oh. Oh. Very oh. good, Francis. Oh. Well, I said we'd probably end up this dig playing sandcastle. <laughs> <laughs> If you missed the revealing Time Team search for Shakespeare's house, you can catch up anytime you like through 4OD. Tonight on 4, the mind-boggling untold story of a secret and very British mission, the Falklands' most daring raid at 8 o'clock. Next, though, it's Springfield's favourite family writ large in the Simpsons movie.